of you and we appreciate you taking the time because time is the one thing we can't make more of. Uh, we can make more money, lose money, but we can't do anything but lose time. So thank you for your kindness and your work and your passion. Uh, what we, I think we can do is you guys go at it and des describe it. And as people ask questions, do you want questions at the end or you want them to interrupt you? Uh, probably wait till the end would be, would probably uh, work out well. All right, then we'll get some time at the end then, Bill, and we'll do that. And uh, so I will, without further ado, I'll turn the floor over to you, sir. Great. Sounds great. Thank you guys uh, so much for having us. Um, what a great opportunity to, to be able to do this. Uh, just give you a little bit of background about uh, kind of how this came about. Uh, this was uh, part of a CFI research project that I finished in July of 2016. Um, with Adam's help and Chief Harris's help at the Middleton Fire District in Wisconsin. Uh, we've been able to present this to two um, NFPA committees. Uh, we were also able to get in. <clears throat> Everyone came to see St. John at FDIC and we, we uh, surprised them and gave them some more candidate uh, research projects. So, we, you know, <clears throat> we weren't surprised y'all came to see him, but uh, they were a little surprised to see us uh, do our research. So, uh, we were given about an hour or so a piece to, to do it there. It was uh, really well received and um, I've been watching you guys and seeing what you guys are doing on social media and uh, it's pretty attractive um, from my perspective on, on the science-based research that's going on with you guys. So um, I reached out to Andy and now we're doing this today. So without further ado, I want to try to share my screen here and get on with this. <clears throat> So it's always nice to uh, put a disclaimer out here. And um, when we were presenting this research, we're talking to people about ultra high pressure and they're like, Oh yeah, well, we know what that is. They do that stuff in the UK or they used to do that stuff with the John beam pumps. Um, and I just want to, to start this out and say that we're not suggesting that ultra high pressure is a replacement uh, for our traditional fire suppression methods or our tactics. Um, I think that it's extremely, uh, we all think that it's extremely uh, useful um, when used in a rapid response vehicle model, which Chief Harris is going to talk to. And then one of the other things we, we hear too is that, you know, is this thing listed in an FPA? It is currently in an FPA uh, 1901 and 1906, uh, the brush truck standard, as well as the engine um, pump testing standard. So it is listed. Um, we did have a, an opportunity to present this to the 1961, the Fire Hose Committee. Um, one of my counterparts, uh, Lisa Herb and Adam St. John, they were just, uh, they just did their, their research was just presented in fire engineering uh, two months ago. And we were able to kind of come in on the tail end of what they were doing and just kind of give them a, a brief overview of what we were doing. So tonight, uh, we'll probably talk for 40 minutes or so in the presentation, then answer your questions. But the overview will be the uh, introduction. We'll talk about the science of actual ultra high pressure. Uh, we'll talk about you know, what it is, the testing and the validation that we did. Um, and we'll talk about utilizing UHP. Chief Harris will uh, talk to you about how he use, utilizes it on a daily uh, basis in Middleton, Wisconsin. So like I mentioned before, you know, why is ATF involved in this ultra high pressure research? Um, I get that question a lot. Um, I was, Part of the CFI um, uh, research that I was doing required us to go to 100 different fire scenes and write up the origin and cause reports. And I was responding to these uh, early on in 2014. I was responding to these fires, specifically in Middleton. And I would walk in after the fire was out. All the drywall was intact. All the burn patterns were left. There was no standing water on the floor. You know, and having a prior fire department background, I'm like, you know, what in the world is going on here? Why, why, why do these fires look different than the fires that I go to, you know, all over the, the rest of the country? And it's because they were using this, this technology at the time. I had no idea what it was. Um, I thought I knew what it was when they mentioned ultra high pressure. I was like, oh, yeah, John Beam pumps and UK stuff. But um, it is different than that. Um, so we had all these artifacts that were left over. So um, it, it dovetails somewhat into fire investigations when there's artifacts left to look at. Um, at fire scenes and sat down with Chief Harris and um, 
basically sat down at his conference table and said, hey, are you sure you want to do this? You know, it may get a little bit of attention. In the end, uh, my jaw was kind of on the floor when he was talking about the tactics they were using. And um, I'm, a, I'm a believer in the whole system now after spending two years doing the research with them. So a little bit about the science of UHP from a fire investigative standpoint. I'm not a fire protection engineer. That's why I have Adam St. John. So hopefully, Adam, if you can chime in on any of the things that I'm missing here. So talking about water droplets and surface area. So when the, when the water is, is pressurized through this ultra high pressure system, it's creating a, a higher velocity than our traditional methods. Um, that higher velocity is called creating a smaller water droplet. That smaller water droplet is creating a more uh, a greater surface area uh, it has a greater surface to mass ratio when it gets introduced into that heated environment um, of, of the actual fire itself. The liquid vaporizes over, we have the conversion and it collects that heat energy. Um, we found in our testing that it was, uh, well, I won't give, give that secret away quite yet, but we, uh, we basically found that it's absorbing heat, as much heat energy as, the, as their traditional uh, methods. We are looking at right here at a video that is a thousand frames per second. We're talking about surface area, surface to mass ratio. As you can see from the slide, the smooth bores, um, the smooth bore that we compared uh, was pumped at 150 gallons per minute uh, compared to a, an automatic fog nozzle, which also pumped 150 GPMs. And then we tested, you'll see it says 20. We actually tested a 30 gallon per minute system. Uh, but we videoed uh, a 20 GPM system. So you can look at this here at a thousand frames per second. And basically what we're trying to show here is that you're actually, you can physically see the actual surface area that's being applied here. These are the water droplets. Um, any future research that gets done, one of the suggestions we would have would be a higher speed, um, you know, so we can actually see the actual uh, water droplets themselves. Um, thanks to uh, Chief Harris, and I apologize for not mentioning this. I'm extremely grateful because all the video production that's done, as you read or heard in Chief Harris's bio, has a, an extensive history um, and all, all the great video production that's being done is, is because of him. <clears throat> So what exactly is UH, UHP? You know, engine discharge pressure is defi defined in NFPA 1901. Is, you know, the traditional system is anything up to 500 PSI. Sorry, the lag there, I gotta go back. So this is the hang up that we see when we're talking about ultra high pressure. Every day that I even bring it up, everyone's like, oh yeah, they've been doing that for years. We tried that back in the seventies, it didn't work. Um, you know, well, that's, that's the CAF system. You know, NFPA 1901, 1906 actually had the, the listed definitions right here on your screen. So the traditional methods that we're pumping on a daily basis on all the fire trucks across the country are, is considered normal pressure. So that's between zero and 500 engine discharge pressure of 500 PSI. High pressure is between 500 and 1100 PSI. That's where the John Beam pumps fell. That's what they do over in the UK. The UK, those guys are using less volume um, than we're using here. So ultra high pressure is anything uh, over 1100 PSI uh, by definition. Um, so that's, a really good base slot to, to basically put us all on the same page um, for the future here. And I'm gonna jump in for a quick second, uh, Agent Fulton. Just uh, specifically the system that was tested and what the model that we use here, we're generally pumping at 1500 PSI at our apparatus, uh, resulting at about 12 to 1300 PSI at the nozzle, just for comparison purposes. 
Thank you. <clears throat> so in Middleton, Wisconsin, they have uh, truly invested into the, the mindset of using ultra high pressure. Chief, can you just speak to that as I list through these units that you have it mounted on? Sure, we utilize, obviously in our wildland attack, our, uh, we have three ATVs with ultra high pressure, 20 GPM uh, systems on it. What's kind of unique there compared to our gasoline powered um, systems that you see in the foreground here in our uh, smaller rapid response vehicles, is they're basically identical. The only difference is the amount of water that we carry on board, but the pressures and the application and uh, system control system are all the same. Uh, the unit in the back, the ultra high pressure system on that heavy rescue is uh, similar with this unit, our MTAC vehicle or our tactical vehicle, and those are PTO driven and 30 gallon per minute uh, ultra high pressure. This particular unit, uh, our MTAC-1, has a 45-gallon per minute ultra-high pressure front turret line as well. But what we find is you really don't want to go anything over a 30 GPM hand line, although it doesn't sound like much uh, at 30 GPM. 30 GPM ultra-high pressure is um, quite a bit and packs a punch. So, And when you're pumping at 45 GPM ultra-high pressure, uh, the truck holds onto it with the uh, front turret. So these are the units that uh, Middleton has it um, mounted on. Uh, this is a comparison here of a two and a half inch here to our traditional inch and three quarter. Um, the hose line for the ultra high pressure system is a either a three quarter inch hydraulic line or a half inch uh, hydraulic line. So it makes it extremely uh, pliable and easy easy to use. It's essentially for the most part, a one-person operation. The actual nozzle itself um, is a, a specific um, engineered nozzle. I would compare this to a, you know, a, a traditional nozzle, if you will, or um, a, an automatic nozzle, but it's, it's, it's engineered to withstand the ultra-high pressures of UHP. This is what the typical um, pump panel is, uh, looks like, if you will. It's supplied by an inch and three quarter supply line there at the intake on the upper on the left hand side right there. Um, it's essentially the, the flip of a switch. It's I mean you'll notice if obviously you've been in the fire service for more than twenty years. It looks like a booster line. And that's essentially what it is there uh, on a, a booster line on a reel to the left hand side. Um, this this truck here can be supplied off of a potable water source um, from a essential a neighbor's house if you needed to it or they can pump it off of a, um, a a pond or chief you want to talk about that too yeah when you say that it's supplied by an inch and three quarter inch hand line it can be uh, supplied by um, an inch and three quarter on down to like you said a potable uh, potable system at five gallons per minute if you will when we gave a presentation at FDIC this year, we went for approximately two hours off the vehicle in front of you now off of the MTAC um, doing our presentation. And uh, we flowed for on and off quite a bit for uh, just over two hours and only used a garden hose to feed it. So that inch and three quarter inch hose is not uh, necessary per se. It's just what in that particular video was supplying the vehicle. Um, our systems are equipped with auto fill systems. So we hit a button and it tends it for us. So as the tank fills up, it automatically shuts down and opens and closes. So um, connecting to whether it be a sump pump off of a swimming pool, a pond, a stream, or off of a garden hose or a hydrant system, um, it tends it for you. We tend to connect with our engine as a supply engine with 750 gallons of water. And if you do the math at 30 gallons with 300 on board, uh, gives us quite a bit of attack time um, uh, upon arrival. So part of the testing that, uh, that we did uh, partnered with, uh, with Middleton was we, we, we've done uh, uh, 21 tests overall. 
Uh, the first initial testing was done in June of 15 in Downers Grove. We did two baseline tests and then we did um, nine uh, room tests. We were given a university here in Downers Grove. Uh, we had identical rooms, essentially uh, Jack and Jill uh, dormitories here. You'll notice the, the fires uh, were set and we, we skipped rooms. Uh, we were cognizant of, of the, the effects of ventilation from the exterior, so we had it uh, uh, buttoned up pretty tight uh, from the top to the bottom. <clears throat> You'll notice at the top of the screen here, just for placement of our thermocouples here, uh, we placed a mannequin in the doorway, top of the screen. Um, the thermocouples that were placed were, were there in those locations. Number six was actually a heat flux gauge. The fire was set. Um, this is our consistent fuel package here. We used the existing um, drawers that were there from the dormitory, um, some styrofoam and um, a standard ignition package that ATF uses here. Uh, we took the temperature readings off of um, one of the thermocouples that was actually listed in the corner um, so we weren't affected with the water. We placed uh, TCs uh, underneath of the helmet of our um, simulated firefighter here, which is in the doorway, underneath of their hood as well as their helmets. <clears throat> So what you're looking at here, we did a total of nine tests. These are three of those nine tests. On the left-hand side, we, we, can, we used a smooth bore nozzle and we used an automatic fog and then we did the ultra high pressure and we did them for set time periods. Um, once the, uh, the temperature inside of our room reached 800 degrees at the six foot level of, on one of our TCs, we placed our, our firefighter in the actual doorway and they were instructed They were instructed to, when they were told to go, they were basically instructed to flow water, hit the ceiling initially, and then do a Z pattern. Um, we tried to replicate that a total of nine different times. Um, and then you'll, you'll see the results of that here. You'll notice once it goes over to thermal imaging that T7 on the right hand side for the ultra high pressure, this is the first test that we did after the two baseline tests. Um, so it, it, the fire, is actually more intense, if you will, um, in that T7 test than it was um, in the additional test. Just because that was that, that first test after those two baseline tests were done. So as you can see from the thermal imaging here, um, we had essentially, it was, it was more intense, if you will. So you'll see the firefighters getting into position here in the doorway. Um, we, we flowed water for those nine tests. For the first three tests, we flowed water for five seconds. So the numbers that you see at the bottom of the screen, you know, the 12 gallons, the 15, five and the 2.7, that was the actual water that was actually flowed. Given Chief Harris's background, we were actually get, able to get down to the frame second. Um, you know, so that's why you have a little bit of a variance on those other two, because we were being extremely uh, specific. Uh, T4 was actually the only um, fire that didn't initially go out after the water was applied to it. Um, so you'll see some of the results after we show you what the rooms look like after the actual fires themselves. So these are the five second tests. After that, we did a series of, we would flow for 10 seconds, and then the third test, we flowed for 20 seconds. So after we looked at, at all nine of those tests in Downers Grove, Illinois in June of 15, uh, essentially looking at the data itself, um, and Adam helped me uh, uh, visually you know, graph all that information. 
Um, basically, it's what we're able to show is that we're using with that ultra high pressure, it's absorbing just as much heat energy as your traditional methods, with the exception of using a fifth of the amount of water um, uh, compared to the, the fog and the solid bore. Uh, there was less water damage there. There were burn patterns that were remaining visible to us, um, as well as um, we also partnered up with another CFI who was placing items inside the actual compartment. Um, collecting uh, DNA and fingerprints. So all those things were left undisturbed. I'm gonna jump in here for a second. And there was a question posted in the chat area wondering what uh, the application methods were. And specifically, they were a straight stream, obviously a solid stream with the smooth bore, straight stream with the automatic nozzle, straight stream with the ultra high pressure nozzle. Um, so, Specific patterns, this is not a system that you have to apply uh, in a narrow fog type scenario unless you choose to. Thanks, Chief. So the, the chart here, all this is available to all of you all in the Dropbox when we're done with this. The research paper is there, all these charts are there, all the videos are available to you, um, and Andy's gonna get that, um, I assume that, that'll get shared at the end of this. So uh, as I go through this, you'll be, um, able to see all this information here. Basically, this is just showing the temperature reductions that occurred with inside those spaces with the with the five, the 10, and the 20 second flows. Um, here are charts right here. Um, you know, the, the time temperature curves um, com comparing, um, you know, the, T, the T2 to the T7 test. <clears throat> you know, and you're allowed, and everyone's like, oh, well, there's gonna be an increase in the temperature. Well, there was an increase in the temperature and that was with the mannequin itself. Uh, if you look at the chart itself, if you take out T7, which you remember that was the one that was the first test after the baselines were done, we had a seven degree um, temperature increase. Um, if you take out that as an anomaly, um, all the other um, increases there were within essentially one degree. Um, you know, granted that was on the mannequin, that was supposed to be our simulated firefighter in the doorway there. <clears throat> The top line here shows the, the solid bore nozzle and the, and the effects of that. Um, the, the middle section there is our fog nozzle. And then at the end or the bottom there, you'll see the ultra high pressure. And it, there truly is a remarkable difference um, when you walk into these scenes and, and they really are truly uh, almost virtually uh, dry at the bottom. So you're probably looking at those tests and like, oh yeah, just a bunch of like drawers and stuff. And quite frankly, you know, I was kind of doing the same thing too, because I wanted to bring the room to full room involvement and had this massive you know, thermal column coming outside the doorway. Well, um, we essentially, as Adam says, we systematically increase the intensity of the test. So these tests here were done in the, at, the, uh, at the fire station. What you're looking at here is we have, um, a burn trailer, a metal burn trailer that has two rooms. It's divided through the center. Uh, we used um, consistent fuel packages on both sides here. We're essentially comparing um, temperature reductions uh, for, the, for the smooth bore on the left-hand side at 150 GPM, comparing that to the 30 GPM system here um, on the right-hand side. You'll notice the conversion, obviously, when you know, water, um, is heated, it's converting over, right? So you'll see that I think there's a lot more conversion occurring on the right-hand side than on the left, uh, because I think we're simply applying more surface area uh, more rapidly. So when this, this test here was done, we flowed, uh, essentially used um, 85 gallons of water on the left and then 17 gallons um, on the right. And I just want to remind you, I'm not suggesting this is a replacement for our traditional stuff, um, but it's definitely a, a potential you know, tool we can put in our, <clears throat> in our repertoire here. So after that, uh, we systematically increased the intensity of the test again. Uh, we were able to acquire a two room structure here. Uh, we're um, initiating uh, our fire in the uh, first level here, we cut out the header. Uh, we were partnering up with another partner out of, Illinois, out of uh, Indiana who was doing some stuff on flow tests. Adam was here for this as well. Um, I think some of the best flow path video uh, captured is, is in this video, which is on the Vimeo links that you guys will get here at the end. So um, 
we'll just kind of watch through this. I want to drag this one through a little bit if I can. Now the thermal couples for this test here uh, were placed in the, the first floor. It was an old kitchen um, as well as at the, the top of the stairs. Uh, the temperatures here will appear on the screen for us uh, here very shortly. Um, again, trying to increase that intens intensity of those tests as compared to the, the ones that we did down there in Downers Grove. So we're using automatic fog on the left-hand side, 150 GPM. Uh, comparing that to ultra high pressure on the right-hand side, flowing 30 GPM. You can see our temperatures here. That's uh, of. Um, Specifically, the temperatures at the top are at the, um, I believe they're at the eight foot level and the bottom is at the two foot level. As the crews made entry here, also it's noted they are making entry not to flow into that specific room. They actually went by the room of origin and made their way to the second story uh, where an additional test was being performed. But no additional water was flown after what you saw on the front porch. So the uh, water flow at the bottom of the screen is uh, extremely accurate about uh, one-fifth again. So test 16, there's a lot going on in this, uh, in this video right here. So in the lower right-hand corner, uh, at the end of the day, we were just trying to, let's just keep pushing and keep pushing like any, uh, you know, good agent that used to be a firefighter would want to do right and i'm sure most of you guys out there were, would agree with me so we essentially had all these all this fuel left over so we we put it all into the second story of this building and um just to kind of give you a layout of the actual building itself you'd walk into the kitchen you go up to the top of the stairs there's a landing there and you'd have four separate rooms at the top um, of this second floor um, the only thermal couples we had left for the day are the ones that you see here uh, one in the cd corner bedroom uh, and one in the AD corner bedroom here. Uh, we're using a 30 GPM system. And we're not going for full extinguishment because essentially when we're done with this, the house is gonna be allowed to just burn down that night anyway. So we just let's just keep pushing, keep pushing, and just keep pushing the limits of, of this ultra high pressure system. So the firefighters, when they made their fire attack here, um, you, when you see the green lights coming on here, there's actually water flowing. Um, so when the green lights go on on the actual rooms with the temperatures, you'll be able to see the, the reductions that are occurring there. Not going for full extinguishment. Firefighters made entry through that same kitchen door, went to the stairs, knocked the fire that was down um, in that actual stairwell, got to the top of the stairs, and essentially they never made entry into any of the rooms. They're essentially fighting it in one room for about 10 seconds and then flowing in to the next adjacent room and then go into the next adjacent room as well. As you watch the video here, I'm not sure if Agent Fulton's gonna play the entire video, but you're gonna see that the entire um, second story structure, again, four rooms fully flashed over along with the hallway. Um, our crews were, when they came out, uh, actually our battalion chief was rather upset in that he wished he could do it again. We were quite surprised that he was able to actually bring that fire under control with 
so little water. But um, he did challenge us with the fact that why the same crew shouldn't to, should have taken a secondary line, a second, not a secondary line as in backup, because that obviously was in place. But for attack, uh, the crew, two of the rooms could be ha managed by um, one attack individual while the other two could have been kept in check uh, by the other individual. So you've got to remember here, as you apply with ultra high pressure, you only need to have one person on that physical nozzle. You're, you have other firefighters peripheral from that, more in safety positions, utilizing thermal imaging, using tools, and so on. But the pressure or the nozzle reaction force is such that you don't need to staff the line solely to uh, withstand the pressures. So we had the second line available to us. We figured it um, easily could have been done in a shorter period of time, estimate being uh, with half the amount of water. So like the chief just mentioned, we weren't going for full suppression. We considered this under control, if you will. So the total flow for that test was 85 and a half gallons of water. So comparing those, uh, those tests here, and Chief Harris is going to talk about the additional tests that we did. It was consistent throughout all the testing that we did as far as the temperature reductions were concerned. Um, they were extremely similar across all three systems, um, with the exception that we're using one-fifth um, of, the, of the amount of water. Adam, can you uh, speak to any of this before we jump into Chief Harris' section? Uh, yeah, I was just learning a lot from the presentation. Great, great job, Bill. Um, you know, I, uh, I had the opportunity to assist with, with some of the testing, um, but one thing I wanted to bring up too is that, that high pressure and ultra small droplets for fixed fire suppression um, has been used for decades in, in the fire protection fields, um, mostly in cruises and anytime you have a, a deep seated fire or uh, concerns about water supply um, or collateral water damage, we use uh, ultra high pressure with nitrogen and sprinkler heads a lot. Um, so the physics is very sound and it's, uh, it's very well accepted. And on the most basic level, right, you're just using this water more efficiently. You have more surface area, so you're, you're taking that liquid and turning it into a gas, which is really when you get all the, 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 the big bang out of water droplets is, is that, that, that phase change. Um, and that's exactly what we saw in your testing was the temperature drop was, was almost identical, very repeatable, but the amount of water used was just less. Um, and, we, and we talk about it like it's a, it's a new thing, and it definitely is in the, uh, the, you know, the, the firefighting world. But in terms of fixed fire suppression, we've been using it for, for a while um, with nitrogen instead of a, as a pump. So it, it's very well accepted in the engineering field, and we'll see what happens in the, uh, the firefighting field. If anybody has any questions for Adam, if you could just unmute yourself now and ask him. Um, I feel guilty because Adam actually had a death in the family and is probably sitting in front of a restaurant somewhere on his phone. So um, if anyone has any questions specifically for Adam, um, you can either email him at the end or, or jump in right now. Um, yeah, I apologize for that, Bill. I'm I'm in my car. I can hang out for, for a little bit. All right. I'm going to jump into uh, Chief Harris's now and then um, just jump off when you need to, but I really appreciate you making the, the time to, to join us, man. Sure thing. <clears throat> All right, Aaron, we're going to go uh, with yours right now. Yeah, th I think this video here that he's about to show kind of wraps up, you know, the public's perception of uh, – of kind of what I was feeling and why we got into it. So I'm going to try to answer everybody's questions that I've been watching in the, the chat room here as we go along. And why did we get into this? And the bottom line is simply, you know, we we're sick and tired of showing up on scene uh, and not being able to do anything and uh, being able to deploy faster uh, with an actual unit that could actually suppress the fire. So that's how we initially got into it. And you can play the video. If I wasn't doing comedy, I'd become a firefighter. I want to be a firefighter so I could drive the fire SUV. Because <laughs> I don't know what the fire SUV does when they get to the fire. Like, damn. Yep, that's a fire. <laughs> Confirmed, that is a fire. Yep. Well, I guess you got to sit here and wait for the fire truck, right? 
but I can put some water on that because this is just the SUV. This is a Chevy Blazer. We have no water hose. I guess those people are going to burn up until the fire truck gets here. It's sad and unfortunate. The fire SUV is like what the supervisor drives, but it's got to be pretty easy to direct people when you're dealing with fire. Hey, guys, right there where it's that fire, yeah, I need you to put some water on it consistently until there's no more fire. They probably had meetings in the morning. Okay, guys, everybody look at the board right here. Hypothetically, if there's fire right here, we want to put water on the fire until there's no more fire. Probably had the same agenda for every meeting, but it just white out the date and write over it, say paper. So yeah, that's kind of it in a nutshell. Um, we were showing up on scene with nothing uh, in hand to be able to suppress the fire. You can begin this video. And over the years of testing and uh, recently validating with the ATF, um, initially testing a, along with the military and the Air Force dating back about 10 years. Um, but this is kind of our response model now. You can see the vehicle on the left is an example of one of our rapid response vehicles. We still deploy uh, you know, an attack engine, uh, heavy rescue, ladder, uh, the full contingency of um, equipment, but the, our, a rapid response vehicle clearly can corner, accelerate, decelerate, drive directly to where the fire is located, um, and arrive simply on scene faster. So earlier on, um, Chief, Starnes, you made the comment, time is one thing we can't make more of. And I couldn't agree with you more. Your son said, time is our most important asset. Again, I can't agree more. Uh, we get our time back through the use of rapid response vehicles. We commit the vehicle, as you see here, directly to uh, the backyard, if that's where the fire is located, uh, the front yard, whatever it may be. But we simply get on scene faster with equipment that can uh, actually suppress the fire. We initially started with a different uh, unit. Uh, we tried some different compressed air foam systems. We've tried um, pressurized water tanks and so on, but nothing that was able to sustain itself and be able to uh, attack as large of a fire as what we found with uh, ultra high pressure. So the tests that um, Agent Fulton and the ATF uh, and we were involved with, did conclude um, and that one-fifth of the water flow, uh, as an example, in comparison to a conventional hand line. And that's what we had been seeing for the last 10 years on the fire ground. Basically, if you're gonna uh, deploy an inch and three-quarter inch hand line on a fire, we'd be, we could deploy an ultra-high pressure hand line between 20 GPM and our 30 GPM systems, and you'd be able to suppress it. So not only is it, uh, we feel, tested um, in, you know, in scientific uh, environments, but obviously over the past several years in real world um, examples. This particular video that we're about to show, and you could start it at any time, it's just simply a one minute knockdown from two different camera angles. This is in northern Wisconsin earlier this summer. Um, the individual on the nozzle had never used ultra high pressure before. Uh, we were just gonna do a transitional attack and just giving an example of what you might find when we arrive on scene and what could you do uh, if you had a, a simple 20 GPM uh, at 1400 PSI ultra high pressure hand line. Uh, you'll notice when he uh, initially starts to make an attack here, he only opens up the bale halfway, which obviously is just um, applying a fraction of the amount of surface area. We eventually kind of um, take over. We kind of explain to him that we may have to take over because it was a pretty good working fire there. But we, we figured we'd use less than um, 20 gallons per minute. I believe in this attack, we used about 17 to 18 gallons to bring completely under control. But um, uh, just application methods uh, are uh, slightly different than a conventional hand line just because simply the water is gonna go up but isn't necessarily 
through gravity going to come down just because of the conversion. But as you can see here, again, you're seeing uh, about 17 gallons of water bringing that initial fire. Um, and Bill, if you could, just click back to the initial screenshot and start playing that video one more time. And, you know, we were arriving on scene of a good working fire. Um, we're just simulating it having uh, plenty of air, plenty of ventilation, a good air track here. But looking at that and not that long ago thinking, we need to have uh, an, a, an attack engine to bring this uh, situation under control and uh, our initial rapid response vehicle wouldn't be able to touch it obviously is proven wrong time and time again because we see this time and time again fully involved uh, garage fires uh, fully involved car fires room and contents fires generally taking anywhere from 10 to 20 gallons of water to bring under control and if not, nothing else, just keeping it within control until an attack engine um, or other apparatus arrives. So it's, it's been quite successful for us. You can move on, Bill, if you'd like. This is some additional testing we did uh, for just to capture on video to help explain to people um, some of the other methods that we use for fire attack. We've been quite successful with attic fires, fires in confined spaces where our crews just simply make entry and use the piercing, um, just using a straight stream to pierce drywall and then open it up on a slight fog pattern and placing it into the attic space in a reverse um, sprinkler head uh, method of attack. And uh, we see time and time again, you know, hidden fires or it, even making entry in an adjacent room to make an attack uh, just because drywall is in the way with the 1500 PSI water spray, um, drywall can be taken out quite easily. Here's an example of making entry into an adjacent apartment complex um, and we can make entry spray through the uh, puncture through the adjacent um, apartment and extinguish the fire quite easily. Now, one of the questions um, in the chat area said, you know, has anybody been injured by the, the water stream? Have we had any issues with the uh, tack line rupturing and so on? And actually, um, the pressures that they use are very specific so that they do not injure uh, somebody. The, you're, you have to get into the 1800 PSI to 2000 PSI range before the water could actually uh, penetrate the skin. Um, we have had situations where somebody's placed their hand in front of the, uh, directly in front of the nozzle and simply put, it's going to sting a little bit. It's going to move your hand really fast, but no different than a conventional hand line flowing at a, about 150 to 200 gallons per minute. So it does not penetrate the skin, um, but it will uh, eventually obviously penetrate drywall. Uh, this example here is just some of the speed of attack that I'm talking about. Um, the easiest way to kind of explain to people how we deploy it and, in, and when we say it's just comparing to a conventional attack engine is simply you're not there yet or we're not there yet with the uh, attack engine. This is just showing the amount of time that's harvested if they were to arrive at the exact same time. So um, when they're deploying here, obviously you're deploying a charged hand line. You know, here they're flowing water in 17 seconds. Um, the Conventional attack line on the left is a 200 foot inch and three quarter inch triple laid line. And I think they've got a pretty good deployment, bringing it up to pressure in 37 seconds. But in 20 seconds, we've, um, we've harvested at least 20 seconds in this situation. And um, that's just on scene time. Now we can, can continue to harvest time because the advancement of a three quarter inch hose line uh, goes quicker than a uh, inch and three quarter inch hand line, let alone 
we see anywhere from at least a minute to um, three minutes time savings just in deployment, um, excuse me, from the station to the scene. So oftentimes the fire is brought under control or would be brought under control before an attack engine would even arrive on scene. You can go ahead and uh, roll this. This is an example video, I believe, of just showing on the left, if we left the video or left the fire to continue to burn while an attack engine is responding versus the time harvested um, upon arrival. And this one I believe is just like a 40 second differential. So if you can deploy this system uh, 40 seconds uh, faster than uh, a conventional attack line, you see, um, see the difference. And I oftentimes say, uh, I'm, you know, when people, you know, say, you know, why one versus the other? And I say, well, surely you don't mean that it's better to continue to let the fire grow, it's to continue to let the fire burn. And the example on the right, if you look at the temperature drops, if you look at the uh, amount of time that it takes, obviously, um, you know, in this situation, I'm looking at about 200 degrees, 250 degrees at the floor level versus 1,060. Um, this is the type of response that we see time and time again as we've deployed it over the last 10 years. It's been on the scene fast, whether we make entry with it or not, or transitional attack, these are, type of, these are the type of results that we see. Simply put, this is a, probably the best example that we can give. Uh, again, here it's showing, I believe, about a uh, uh, 45 second, 40 to 45 second um, time harvest. <clears throat> 